right. Uh, thank you very much, first of all, uh, to Lenny Christensen and Gustav Pless, uh, who I invited here today and they accepted to be interviewed uh, because we are going to talk about uh, the lens ladder D warning systems that are operational for two very famous, I can say, uh, lens lights uh, that uh, you, know, you are monitoring and warning for in Norway. Uh, both of you are from the Norwegian uh, Wooden and Energy Directorate. And, and they, they, you are managing, you know, the director is managing the warning systems for these uh, Hawkness and Mannen, I'm not sure if I pronounce them correctly, lens lights, together with other um, important lens lights, rock slides uh, uh, in Norway. Is that uh, so, you know, how many lens lights are you currently moni monitoring for warning purposes? Uh, we are doing uh, real-time uh, monitoring of seven landslides in Norway. And when we are having some more, some less extensive monitoring on a number of other, about 20 other landslides. And those are widespread, uh, widespread, sorry, in, the, in different areas of Norway, right? They are, they are spread around the country, but they are obviously focused on the high mountainous areas. So m most of them are in the western part of Norway, southwestern, and then in the north of Norway. All right. So of course, you know, Lene, Gustav, you, uh, you know, whoever wants to answer, you can also you know, complement each other. I'm. Uh, I, I, let's talk about the two uh, lens lights that are most uh, well known, also because you know there are publications about them, and also because of the help of what they mean. Uh, the Hawkness and the Mann and Lens lights. Uh, what are the main characteristics of these rock slides that you are warning for? Yeah, um, I can talk about the Hawkness landslide. It's a, um, it's a very, or it's a large landslide, one of the larger that we have. Uh, it's 54 million cubic meters in the largest scenario. And it has a very pronounced back scarp and sliding plane. Uh, it's on a quite steep slope, so it's a 35 degrees surface inclination approximately. And it's uh, and the main issue, of course, is that uh, if it slides, it goes into the fjord and creates a displacement wave. Yeah, indeed, you know, maybe it is well known uh, also because, you know, a lot has been said uh, about the possible tsunami that will... Uh, you no, know, be caused by this landslide in case uh, you know, the, ma the mass detaches uh, from uh, the cliff and goes into the fjord. What, what, approximately cubic uh, meters, uh, do you have a figure about how, how big is it? Yeah, the, the biggest scenario is 54 million cubic meters. And then we have a faster moving flank, which is about 18 million cubic meters. So, um, but, but the worst case scenario, the 54 million cubic meters creates the uh, main evacuation zone for, for the landslide then. Thank you about that. And what about the other one, the Mannen landslide? Um, yes, the Mannen uh, landslide, probably it's uh, maybe most famous for the part that failed in 2019. And um, but that was just a very small section of the landslide or the rock slide itself. So the main scenario, it's uh, about 18 million cubic meters and it's lying in the really steep uh, Romstalen. Uh, a failure would not uh, hit any water body, but it would uh, spread across the valley and impact some farms and also block uh, the river. So the part that failed uh, in 2019, that's just uh, that uh, was just 54,000 cubic meters. So that was much uh, smaller, and um, but it it was creating a lot of issues for the local residents there because uh, it was moving so fast. So we had a large number of uh, reports of rate hazard levels and evacuations of the local residents there. Okay, that's definitely, you know, when you're talking about evacuation and uh, we, we are we are definitely dealing with a part that is the, 
uh, one of the issues that are dealt with in on a, in warning systems. So talking about warning systems, you know, these two landslides are you know two different scenarios, but there are two big rock slides. Uh, about the systems, the warning systems, when did they start become operational for these uh, two landslides and how many years even before that did it take to develop the systems? Yeah, um, I mean, Orkness was uh, the first one and it, I think it was discovered already that there was a big crack there, a back fracture in the 60s and 70s and then um, since 1983, I think, they measured it manually across the back scarp. And then 93, again, 10 years later, they started installing some instruments. And since 2004, they've had uh, a larger installation there. But, uh, but new sort of landslides that are uh, discovered a lot by satellite now, and then, you know, this implementation of uh, instruments would go much faster. So it's continuously monitored, at least since uh, 1993. And uh, in terms of, and, and the other one, uh, the, the minor one? Uh, yeah, it was primarily mapped around 2007, 2008. And then it was uh, instrumented in 2009 and 2010. So that was uh, instrumented later and less extensively than Ocnus. So it's really been an evolving process. So the ones that were instrumented the first, they have a much more complex monitoring systems. And the, the later ones that have come, we are, we are focusing on a more simple type of monitoring. Talking about that, then we move to the warning models. So what exactly, you know, uh, we are talking about what you monitor. I want to talk about what you monitor in order to uh, you know, warn the, the people. Uh, how many warning levels exist? Is there multiple warning levels for the, these two systems uh, and uh, the main characteristics of the warning model? What are they? We are we're dealing with four levels. We are, we're calling them hazard levels. So green, yellow, orange, and red. And green, it's the normal state. And actually all of the monitored objects have been green as long as we have monitored, except this uh, Westleman and which failed in 2019. Um, so yeah, the four levels is very common to many systems and also the color code is something that many use uh, around the world in this way. So uh, both of them have been green all the time, but in this uh, specific uh, case, what happened in that uh, uh, year? Or how did the, the system react to that small reactivation? Or not reactivation, small uh, occurrence within the big system of the man and landslide. So you're talking about the small part that failed? The one in 2019 so, that you mentioned, yes. Yeah. So. When, when we started to monitor this particular section of the slope, already it was moving extremely fast compared to the rest. And that was in 2014. So actually we had the elevated hazard levels from, there, uh, from this part already from 2014. And every year we, had, uh, we, we were proceeding into yellow and orange and red since then. But, but then in particular 2018 and 2019, the movement was extremely fast. So I think we were measuring maybe more than six meters in 2018 and even more at, at the year of the failure. So it had uh, incredible fast movement and the movement was, uh, was associated with rainfalls primarily. So we had very rapid accelerations following rainfalls. And that was why it was so hard to monitor and warn because we had these repeated events where the velocity became so high that we had to, we had to put the red hazard level. 
so it was a huge issues for issue for the population below yeah indeed i'm asking uh, because you had so do you had the red hazard level sometimes uh, uh, also before 2019 but yes. then in, in 2019 you put the red hazard level for for a long period of time and w- what is the, the re- i mean what does it uh, mean in terms of response so people had to evacuate from their place yes they were evacuated uh, by the police when the red hazard level is reported but uh, uh, for the failure itself i think we were reporting the red hazard level six days before the failure occurred but we had done it uh, several times before even uh, though the fa- the slope didn't fail so that's really hi- that really highlighted the problem with the early warning method because it's a big issue for the people there and the farm they had to rem- uh, to move animals and everything and the trains had to be stopped and it's and this was a very small area that was evacuated this was really like for resident houses. Ah, okay. And uh, maybe Gustav can comment uh, if, uh, on the Ogner side because then it's a matter of thousands. Yeah, so, so this is, you know, yeah, for, exactly. for us, Go, this is a... Please. Yeah, for us, this is a, a good, uh, almost training exercise. The Vesleman, and, you know, we could, we could uh, test the system, how it responded and, and, and how everything worked. And then... Everyone also realizes that, you know, for a case like uh, Orkness, where we would have to evacuate uh, maybe 5,000 people compared to 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 Vesslemanen, and and you know, doing repeated evacuations of that much people, that would be a disaster in itself. So um, yeah, so so on Orkness, we have uh, for a few years now investigated the possibility of stabilizing Orkness through drainage because this is uh, both you know the the consequences of a slide but also the consequences of repeated evacuations would be very undesirable yeah so at the moment you know I don't want to move out now or from early warning but you are saying that at the moment you are also trying uh, uh, no you, you're already implemented the some mitigation measures uh, uh, and can you could you see some effect on the movements yet or yeah no we haven't implemented any ah, okay. Your plan. Uh, mitigation measures yet but we have investigated sort of the and done lots of simulations and work on this and, and the next step would be to to start implementing mitigation measures yeah but, no, but we, yeah, let's go this back isn't to decided seems- yet Absolutely. Mm. It's interesting, you know, uh, of course, you are comparing different, uh, uh, no, the, the two ones that we are discussing today, they are different, not only uh, for their physical characteristics, but also because uh, in terms of consequences uh, and the people that you have to uh, act upon, uh, it's a very different set of people and number of people. So in Manen, you were able then to uh, uh, locate uh, a relatively small number no, of residents that were potentially affected, but, uh, but by the small, uh, did they understand correctly? Yes. Yes, uh, but, but actually the run out was less than expected. So even when the failure occurred, uh, the houses were not destroyed. And also in the previous, uh, let's call them false uh, alerts of previous years did you uh, again uh, uh, limited yourself to a relatively small section of the, the slope there for a few people yes. or was it widespread no it, uh, this was really a small sector and it was the same that uh, had this fast movement year from year so we did a uh, run out modeling and uh, uh, evaluation of the hazard zone for that particular section. So only this this quite small zone was evacuated. 
Now let me ask you something based on this experience, you know, uh, given that something indeed failed was a part of the big landslide that you are monitoring. But at the same time, you are telling uh, us that, uh, you know, the, uh, there were quite few, uh, let's call them false alarms, but anyway, you know, many warning, uh, warnings before the event. Yeah. And also the event was less uh, uh, impacting than forecasted. What is the reaction of the people now? And what is your current monitoring stage? I mean, how is the landslide doing now? Um, for for the re reactions of the residents, I think we had the focus for years to have a really close uh, dialogue with uh, affected people and also with the municipality. So we were trying to be as open about the situation as possible. And this is a really steep uh, valley where people are used to, to quite serious types of uh, natural hazards. But, and I would say in general, it was uh, well accepted even the the evacuations but of course there were there were criticism that it was too much and and uh, it's not it's obviously it's a difficult situation i think i think uh, afterwards i mean the, the the residents they said themselves they didn't want to be in the houses when the area failed so they were happy actually to be evacuated at that time. And for the for the situation afterwards, it uh, of, of course it was not so such a clean break. So some materials were left behind, and with the monitoring system we have used primarily, which is a ground-based INSA, we could see for a while the movement of the small remaining uh, debris. But basically it has uh, settled and now uh, last year it didn't move that much. Okay, thank you. And uh, in, just like to continue now briefly about this landslide, then maybe we move to Oakness again. Uh, the stakeholders, who are they for you? Mean I mean, you know, you are managing the system, but then who do you warn? Do you go directly to the residents of the people of the, the areas that you highlighted as you know, dangerous areas, or do you go to the mayor? Do you go to both of them? How do you interact with who? Uh, the the communication has been quite important for us. So so what we do concretely. We first uh, we first uh, uh, send a, a message to the municipality and the county and the police, and that 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 now we will change the hazard level. And then and then we uh, publish it on our website and on a, on a, something called Vasum. Where, where all the Norwegian like natural hazards are re rep uh, reported to. So it's available for everybody. And uh, the reaction of the residents, do you get feedback from them directly uh, at times or is it always uh, you know, a feedback that goes from them to their uh, you know, uh, local uh, representatives and then uh, you get it? I, th I think mud, some of the dialogues has been taken by the municipality. And then we have also had direct uh, dialogue. Yeah. So that's been mixed. And one important, uh, I guess, uh, part is that we, uh, our hazard levels are advisory to, to the police. So the police takes decisions on evacuations and so forth. That's not our authority. But uh, I mean, it's followed closely. Yeah. yeah. So, so you're saying it, you know, anyway, you advise the police of your technical, you know, you, you give a technical advice to them 
and then they have the last uh, decision, but anyway, they have like they don't follow your technical advice. It's okay, I understand. I understand what you're saying. Sorry, I, I was trying to repeat it in a better way, but it's even I repeated it in a worse way. But moving to Oakness, it's a totally different setting, as we said. And then there, from what I understood, correct me if I'm wrong, you never issued anything but green. So it's, it's always been in green level, right? Yeah, yeah. So the, the movement at Orkness is generally linear, so no acceleration. And so in that system that has been, you know, in that lens that it has been monitored since, monitored since a very long time, and now, you know, the, the system, the warning system is in place. Did you ever have uh, um, the need to update, I don't know, thresholds or to update some parts of the wording model. Yeah, um, we haven't operated with fixed thresholds, so it's uh, it's more of a uh, we see you know the acceleration and then we would take the decision based on on, on that. But uh, we have been working a lot or we will as well in the future be working a lot on sort of making different scenarios that we have uh, maybe potentially smaller evacuation zones ready sort of if we see this scenario starts moving we can evacuate this area if we see this scenario so this is something that we're working on not to because the, the main scenario is a very large evacuation area in that case, given you know, the landslide is in one place and the people are in a totally different place, uh, I mean, uh, along the coastline of the fjord and the different villages, what is their, uh, your communication uh, strategy? Sorry, I have to... Okay, I'm not sure. It says that we have uh, less than 10 minutes to go, but it's okay. Um, what is the communication strategy there? So how do you interact with local uh, responsible uh, municipalities or others? Yeah, yeah, it, it would be the, the exact same thing, only a much larger scale. Uh, we would have to interact with lots of different municipalities and uh, counties because the, the wave will travel out. Um, but but otherwise, and, and then of course, this would be, um, probably visible at the more much more national scale with a lot of resources in this area if evacuation yeah in the, indeed but the, uh, you mentioned the wave you know the tsunami that could occur there there was a movie that was uh, maybe inspired by that as well you mm. know, a few years back i'm wondering whether uh, the communities and people in those communities ever ever no, interacted with you on, on these issues. Yeah, yeah. They're actually quite interested and in, in, in knowledgeable about the, the subject. You know, they, there's a lot of people who take interest in it. And we have uh, had regular meetings with, when people can come if they want to, and we can inform about what we're doing now. And um, so, you know, just keeping a, a good communication with the, the residents living there and making sure that they feel safe by what we're doing and not sort of threatened by the landslide is, is an important part. Yeah. I have one last uh, you know, question that comes to mind and maybe we can wrap up. Uh, in order to operate this system, you know, it's you as an, an agency, you know, the director at NV, but then how many people indeed are needed to operate such systems? Mm. I think we are about 17 people employed uh, now in this uh, section of NV. So and uh, maybe six geologists and the rest are technical. And there's, uh, you know, continuous work on all these sites. There's always something that needs to be done. So yeah, 17 people continuously. So we are talking about 17 of you within your institution for uh, around 10, uh, if I, how many sites you said that you're monitoring in Norway? Uh, uh, yes. Se seven, seven high risk objects. Seven. Sorry, where okay. it's really extensive okay, monitoring. And, and, and it's only you, or do you also have extra um, other institutional agencies or companies that are engaged daily on these uh, operations? Oh, it's uh, for, for, for the main part, it's ourselves. But I should maybe say that uh, the ma the mapping 
in Norway, it's done by the Norwegian Geological Survey. So they are working on these large uh, rock slides as well. And they are identifying the one that needs to be monitored. Okay, okay, that, that part uh, for sure, but then on the on the daily operations, you know, it's a, yeah. anyway, you know, your answer lets yeah. me understand that it's um, a significant uh, you know, amount of human and of course also uh, economic resources in order to run these yeah. systems on, on a daily basis and to keep them going. Uh, given that we are talking about two, uh, we've been talking about two of them, but there are others. The others, did they ever go beyond green stage? At any point? No. Okay. No, not yet. Let's say no, no, not for now. Yes. <laughs> Can I ask you now? Last question is like a, a free question, open question. Anything else you want to add in relation to what we've been discussing? Lena? Maybe? Uh, I could say just for the, the, the threshold values, maybe. Please. Because, uh, because that was a big issue for Westleman. And at this side, we were actually actively evaluating the threshold values for the different hazard levels year to year. And we were mainly increasing the threshold values in the upper part because we saw from experience that actually it moved a lot and didn't fail. So the controlling part of this slope was really the, the foot of this instability. And in this part, we didn't change the threshold value so much, but I think it's an important part when we start to see the bigger movements, maybe there has to be a constant evaluation of such uh, hazard level threshold values. Thank you very much. It's totally you know, understandable that, uh, you know, when you start with something and monitoring something, you may be, you know, you, there's a tendency of uh, uh, putting thresholds that are uh, typically lower than needed, typically, you know, yes. because then, then, then you adjust with time, but you don't have experience beforehand. Therefore, you know, yeah. that, that's a tendency that you know, occurs um, many times. Thank you. And uh, Gustav, you want to say something? No, nothing to add. Thank you. Nothing specific to close, so Nothing I guess specific. we can close this conversation. We actually went longer than expected. You know, the three of us said maybe we are going for 15 minutes. We stayed a little longer than that. But I thank you uh, very, very much for, first of all, for having accepted the invitation, then for you know, our discussion today, interesting discussion about these two systems. And um, that's it. I can say bye-bye to you and uh, bye to the viewers. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.